who aren't participating in this debate to either sit quietly or leave the chamber, please. So, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, this evening we are, of course, debating the National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020. And Labor does not oppose this bill. Uh, we note that it establishes a new statutory office for the National Skills Commissioner that will provide the Minister and Secretary of the Department with advice on skills demand, labour market and workforce development issues. We also note that the Commissioner will provide advice in relation to current, emerging and future workforce needs, pricing for VET courses, the public and private return on government investment in VET qualifications, the performance of Australia's VET system for providing VET, issues affecting Australian and international labour markets. The Commissioner is also supposed to collect data and uh, analyse that data to inform policy development and programme delivery. Noble objectives if uh, the government uh, had sought to get them a bit more quickly and also hadn't abolished our um, previous governance that allowed these kinds of things to happen put in place by Labor. We on this side of the chamber want to see that we always ensure and act on strong expert policy evidence and advice. Our skills and workforce development needs should uh, have this advice and, and be acted on. We have an excellent track record in Labor. In government, we established the Skills Australia. Uh, we established Skills Australia in 2008, and of course, this became the Workplace Productivity Agency back in 2011. This agency analysed and reported on Australia's current and emerging and future workforce development needs. And in contrast, what did we get from the Abbott Liberal government? One of their first acts in government was to close it down back in April 2014. So here we are some six years later, and it's taken six years for this government to come to understand that the creation of a quality vocational education system, uh, in order to create one, we do at the very least need independent reliable analysis of our labour market and our skills need. So, Labor does not oppose this bill. It has an important objective. Uh, we see that the creation of the National Skills Commissioner is yet another tweak in a vocational education system that needs systematic and comprehensive reform, something that we've yet seen no sign of from this government. We need much more than a skills commissioner nestled in a government department to fix what is wrong in this system. A government that's prepared to fiddle at the edges of the current system isn't going to address the very significant and profound problems that undermine vocational education and training in our nation. Consequently, the productive performance and international competitiveness of our economy is under-supported through skills in our nation. The very unfortunate truth is that Australia's TAFE and vocational education system is under significant pressure. It's under this pressure because of Liberals' poor and incoherent policies and indeed their significant and very, very massive cuts. There has been a palpable lack of leadership from this government in the vocational education and training system. When the Liberals took government, the Commonwealth essentially vacated the field. Instead of continuing the task of building a strong and reliable system of vocational education, what did we see? We saw slashed funding to TAFE, slashed funding to training by three billion and underspend of your own budgets by another one billion. Under your watch, we've seen apprentice numbers fall by 140,000. This government's presided over a national shortage, a shortage of tradies, apprentices and trainees. So it's all very well for the Prime Minister 
uh, to draw attention to this problem when in six years we've had a government that hasn't done anything about it. A further 100,000 apprentices and trainees will be lost by the end of this year alone if this government fails to take immediate action to keep current apprentices in jobs and support employers to take on new ones. The nation calls on you to take this action, and yet there's nothing in your uh, policies in this COVID economic crisis that significantly address this problem. Australians need and deserve excellent TAFEs and universities, and you have gutted, the Liberals have gutted both. The Prime Minister and the Liberals have spent seven years ignoring the vital role of TAFE and the role it plays in the growth of our communities and young people and the critical role it plays in the growth of our economy. At the same time, we can see in our nation that we have 2.6 million Australians either unemployed or looking for more hours of work. We've seen years and years of abandonment, abandonment by the Liberal Party, and too many Australians have either been locked out of quality TAFE training or have lost confidence in the promise of a vocational education. The consequences of this failure are being felt right around our nation. From Bathurst to Bendigo, Joondalup to Juneen, the Prime Minister has abandoned our TAFE and the Liberals have no plan or action of action for good jobs and quality skills development. We've seen this government forsake casual workers under JobKeeper showing disregard for these working people. We know that skills development breaks down in poor quality jobs. That's what becomes of poor skills development, is poor quality jobs, casual and part-time jobs, where people barely get trained, barely get the training they need to do those jobs. We've seen massive growth in low quality, privately delivered courses, putting pressure on TAFEs and other quality providers trying to keep standards high being undercut. This does nothing but result in a race to the bottom. Across the VET system, we've seen a decline in outcomes for students with dropping enrolments and, very importantly, low completion rates. Costs, costs have been shifting to students as they've been hit with fee increases and a growing limitations on access particularly for students in our regions, and less government support. At its very worst, we know what we've seen in terms of, def of the defraud defrauding and exploitation of people trying to improve their lives through getting an education and qualifications. In the last seven years, we've had a government that simply watched this all unfold. They have done nothing but make further cuts and contribute to further costly mistakes. Now we are in a situation where they are returning small parts uh, of the things that they have stripped out, and they are returning those things into a broken system. We have seen seven years of utter failure and utter neglect. This government has finally, at this point in time, finally decided to establish the National Skills Commission, and yes, we will support them in doing so. It is the right thing to do, but given the state of the crisis in our nation currently, it's barely a start given the magnitude of the problems that this government has created. Uh, turning to the issue of skilled visas within this context, the bill establishes a skills commissioner to have a focus on current emerging and future workforce needs uh, and, indeed, Australian and international labour markets. The bill and the government are very quiet on the issue of temporary, uh, skilled temporary visas and how these areas will be managed into the future. This government's had an absolutely ham-fisted approach when it comes to reform in this area. The government announced changes to the old 457 visa system and then had to backpedal because those changes had been such a failure. 
As part of this reform, the Liberals introduced a new skilling fund, Skilling Australia Fund, and we are just some three years later, just $463 million of this fund has been reallocated, money that could have and should have been spent to support hundreds of thousands of apprentices and trainees. You should be spending money keeping those apprentices and trainees in those jobs now, because that's what the money is for. It's to get Australians skilled so that you don't have to draw down on a foreign workforce. So there are plenty of questions that have been left unanswered in this legislation, such as what role the Commissioner will play with Home Affairs to determine the requirements of Australia's temporary workforce, skills workforce, what role the Commissioner plays in reviewing the short-term skilled occupation list and the uh, long-term strategic skills lists, how will the views of workers and their representatives be taken uh, into consideration by the Commissioner? We know that the Interim Skills Commissioner is a formal, former Liberal Chief of Staff, former Chief Economist at Deutsche Bank and Chief Economist at the Business Council of Australia. So how will those views be balanced and all of the options taken into consideration? These are very important issues that this government has neglected. And it is indeed, uh, I think, shows how transparent the government uh, is in wanting to talk up this area when it has done nothing to address that balance between training and, the, uh, and bringing in skilled labour from overseas. The first time we really hear our Prime Minister in this nation do anything key about skills, well, when was it? Well, it was when uh, the flow of international labour migration was turned off. They're really the first time that we have seen uh, these issues elevated in any way. We've had a failure on JobMaker from this government. JobMaker, better known as Job Faker. This government has been a skills killer. It should have not taken a pandemic for this government to turn their attention to our vocational training system. You've spent seven years creating a tradie crisis in Australia, $3 billion cut from TAFE and training, widespread skill shortages and 140,000 apprentices and trainees have gone. This is a big mess, but what has been the Prime Minister's solution? This phony announcement, a phony announcement with no extra funding, no time frame and no detail. No money, no time frame and no detail. It's more spin, more spin from marketing. This is exactly what we've come to expect from this ad man. No plan, heavy on rhetoric, very light on detail. In contrast, Labor put forward uh, with Anthony Albanese on the 29th of October Labor's intention to establish the Jobs and Skills Australia. Unlike the Skills Commission uh, in this bill, Labor's Jobs and Skills Australia would be an independent statutory authority providing genuine partnership with business leaders, large and small, state and territory governments, unions, education providers and those who understand particular regions, cohorts and skills. We would enhance the National Skills Commission to become Jobs and Skills Australia, to establish a more collaborative approach with an enduring structure. It's significant that this COVID pandemic has changed the way we think about ourselves, the way we work and our interaction with the world around us. We are now experiencing one of the greatest economic transformations of our lifetimes, and we are faced with choices about how to go forward. We have a government here that lacks action and has no ambition for working people. Unlike the Liberals and Nationals, Labor believes that funding education is an investment in our nation's future, our future prosperity, and it is not a cost burden. A government, and this government, this Liberal Morrison government, without a plan for education and training, has no plan for Australia's future. So we do not oppose this bill today, but as usual from this government, it is too little, 
too late. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise on, the, on behalf of the Greens to speak to the National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020. The bill in front of us today implements one of the key recommendations of the Joyce Review, which is to set up a skills commission at the core of the skills system. The Joyce Review reported in March 2019 and examined Australia's vocational education and training system to strengthen skills. The National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020 establishes a new statutory office to be known as the National Skills Commission, which is to be headed by the National Skills Commissioner. The bill also specifies the Commissioner's functions and enables the establishment of an advisory committee to advise the Commissioner. Um, I'll flag up front that I will be moving an amendment to ensure that the Advisory Council is at least somewhat balanced with at least one TAF representative on it. We know the Liberals' agenda on vocational education and training is one of massive privatization. We simply cannot have an Advisory Council that is fully stacked with business interests and private providers. The Greens support this bill. But I also want to talk about how all of this is merely window dressing so, th so the Liberal Nationals can hide their decimation of our incredible public TAFE system. A publicly owned and properly funded TAFE system plays an essential role in building an economically and socially just society by offering lifelong educational opportunities and skills development across the country in regional, rural and metropolitan areas. But in typical liberal national fashion, they manage to continue to degrade TAFEs and ignore the rot at the heart of their conservative approach to education. The bill in front of us sadly does nothing to address the destruction the liberal national government has wrought on public VET in Australia. Skills and training have been underfunded by tens of millions of dollars in just the last year alone. It was only recently that we saw Labour and the Liberals team up to abolish the $4 billion Education Infrastructure Fund. Combined with this is a chronic underspend in skills funding, and the result is that TAFEs, TAFE teachers and their students are being starved of resources. What is entirely missing from this piece of legislation, and indeed from any vocational education and training legislation the government has on their agenda is any sign that they intend to seize their slow but purposeful destruction of our public TAFEs. People who go to TAFE perform incredible work that is socially important. If anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that vital work such as nursing, childcare, early childhood education, social work and community services is central to how we organize as a society and how we care for each other. The benefits of hands-on experience and technical skills students acquire in TAFE are unmatched. The cuts to arts courses across the country by the Turnbull government a few years ago pretty much wiped out vocational arts education. These skills and others become even more vital as we work to rebuild after the bushfires and the pandemic. Failing to fund them properly is incredibly short-sighted and it's destructive. Yet we've seen TAFE being slowly destroyed by the government's neglect, a lack of funding and privatization. Skills and training are of course vital for the future, a future where we set ourselves up to be a renewables powerhouse, a future with a just transition from polluting fossil fuels to a long-term sustainable and life-making work. Most importantly, we cannot forget our regional and rural communities. Not only do TAFEs have a strong relationships with their regional and rural communities, but they can play a leading role in education, training, skills, development, and the economy. Yet, this bill neglects to focus on this important need. And I will be moving an amendment that was moved by the member of INDI, Dr. Helen Haynes in the other place, which inserts a much needed focus on regional areas in the commissioner's role. Skills and training will also be essential 
for the resurgence and recovery of Australian manufacturing. That, in turn, is fundamental to addressing the twin challenges of growing inequality and environmental and climate crisis. Just and sustainable manufacturing with decent jobs that value workers are fundamental to a future that is livable for all of us. That's what workers deserve, and that's what we're working on as part of the Green New Deal. We can't talk about this future and not talk about vocational education and training. Over the last decade, we have seen a decimation of our world-class TAFE with massive funding cuts, increasing fees, and the privatization of the sector, which saw the entry of shonky providers. In the last fortnight alone, we've seen further decline in apprenticeship numbers, news the, governments have, the government has now been forced to repay more than $1.2 billion in student loans because of the rotting of labor liberal VET privatization. And yet even more alarming language about even more market marketization coming out of the Productivity Commission. As Maxine Sharkey from the Australian Education Union said last week of the Productivity Commission report, and I quote, the report's recommended options, including voucher schemes and increasing income contingent loans are extremely risky and open the sector up to a repeat of VET fee help style rorting by unscrupulous private providers. This disaster needs to be reversed and it needs to be reversed now. Our TAFEs are vital for people to be able to gain the skills needed for transition and transformation. This is good for individuals and even better for the whole of society. On vocational training, the government says one thing and does another. They say they want to encourage people into trades, but then they underfund skills training by tens of millions of dollars. The motivation for the deliberate undermining of TAFEs by state and federal governments is no mystery. They are ideologically opposed to the very principle of lifelong public education particularly when there's a buck to be made for their friends and donors in the for-profit education corporations by directing public funds their way. The Greens are and always will be the party of public education, and we are proud to support our TAFEs. We have a plan to rebuild TAFE as the vocational training provider of choice for students. We will remove the Gillard-era contestable funding requirements and make TAFE and uni free for all. Removing private for-profit providers entirely from federal funding of vocational training and making TAFE's first priority for all federal funding for vocational education and training. This is a bold vision, and we need that vision for VET in Australia, not the piecemeal and destructive approach that the government has taken. Senator Molden. Acting uh, Deputy uh, President, uh, it's my pleasure to rise this evening to speak on the National Skills Commission Bill 2020. And the reason for this bill is because of the overwhelming importance of skills in a modern post-COVID economy. And we've been, it, we, we have been asked this evening by previous speakers that we are to provide the money, the time and the detail, and that will be provided, that is provided. It's a noble objective, said Senator Pratt, and Senator Pratt will support this bill. The National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020 will establish a new statutory position, the National Skills Commissioner, and specify the functions of the Commissioner. The establishment of the National Skills Commissioner is a critical new piece of Australian economic infrastructure and a vital element of the Prime Minister's recently announced job maker plan, enabling us to navigate economic recovery, lifting productivity and laying the foundations for a prosperous future. Vocational education and training, one of the key career pathways, can further improve our capacity to grow, compete and thrive in a global economy, particularly a post-COVID economy. 
The Commissioner will provide independent expert advice and national leadership on the Australian labour market, current and future skills needs and workforce development issues. This role could not be more timely as we address the critical challenges of managing the health and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Commissioner and the National Skills Commission will help prepare Australia's labour market for recovery. They will establish a robust new evidence uh, base to strengthen the Australian education and training system. The varied roles of the National Skills Commission demonstrate huge potential for it to quickly become a vital central hub supporting and enhancing the operation and analysis of the national labour market, as well as striking through the complexity of the current VET system and strengthening the architecture of VET in Australia. Australia's economic recovery will be particularly reliant on a highly skilled, resilient and adaptable workforce. The skills needs of the economy are likely to evolve and the jobs that will be made uh, as we come out of the crisis may not be the same as those that were lost. The government has identified skills and training as a priority in the recently announced job maker plan. We have outlined a reform agenda that will make VET work for Australians again. It will do so by providing a trusted training system that can deliver workers with high quality and relevant skills and a support rapid and support rapid upskilling and reskilling in growth areas to support a new generation of economic success and guarantee the essentials that Australians rely on. The National Skills Commission will help ensure the skills and training systems support all Australians, including vulnerable cohorts, in facing the challenge of working out how to live and work and retrain in a way that creates a sustainable COVID-safe economy. The Commissioner will provide detailed labour market analysis, including an annual report setting out the skill, needed, the skill needs of Australia. The NSC will also publish close to real-time data on labour markets to flag emerging skills shortages and other labour market trends. Data from the Commissioner will power the National Careers Institute to provide students with the most accurate and comprehensive data on where jobs will be and what skills and qualifications they need to get them. This will help show that trade and skills jobs are ones to be as aspired to as a first best option, not looked down upon or seen as a second best option. It builds on our $585 million delivering skills for today and tomorrow skills package and contributes to what the COAG saw uh, as an agreed vision for VET to be a responsive, dynamic and trusted sector. Together with the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment, Governance and Other Matters, Bill 2020, this bill delivers some of the key elements of the 2019 Expert Review of Australia's VET system, led by the Honourable Stephen Joyce. The Morrison government is committed to driving improvements in the quality, relevance and accessibility of the VET system to underpin Australia's economic recovery. Let me talk a bit about the content of the bill. The functions of the National Skills Commissioner set out in this bill will support a stronger, more agile VET system in a number of ways. Firstly, the Commissioner will consolidate and strengthen labour market and skills needs analysis to provide an independent and trusted source of information about what is happening now and into the future. The innovative use, innovative use of new data sources and advanced data analytic techniques will support the Commissioner in becoming a trusted source of sophisticated labour market information, analysis and forecasting. This research and analysis will draw on emerging data sources and cutting-edge analytic techniques to ensure Australia's labour market analysis capability is world-leading. It will help close skill gaps and provide confidence to employers, students, tertiary educators and Australian governments that we are investing in the right skills at the right time. This is essential to prepare Australians for the future opportunities of today and tomorrow. Secondly, 
The Commissioner will examine the cost drivers and develop and maintain a set of efficient prices for VET courses to improve transparency, consistency and accessibility for students. Current VET prices and subsidies vary considerably around Australia, with students paying different prices for the same course and facing various levels of quality. For example, there is currently a difference of $11,745 in subsidies between Western Australia and Queensland for students studying a Diploma of Nursing, and it is not clear what is driving this. For the Diploma of Building Design, there is a difference of $6,855 in subsidies for students studying at TAFE New South Wales and TAFE Queensland, with the TAFE New South Wales students facing a, a cost of $3,600 and the TAFE Queensland uh, students facing a cost of $10,455. And a student studying a Certificate three in Blinds, Awning and Security Screens will receive a subsidy of 3,726 in Queensland, 9,630 in New South Wales and no subsidy in Victoria unless the qualification is taken as an apprenticeship. Core to the Commissioner's pricing work will be consideration of quality. An efficient price does not necessarily mean the lowest price, but one that provides value for money. It means the price that needs to be paid to secure training that delivers the skills that employers need and sets the students up for a valuable career. Finally, the Commissioner will lead research and analysis to examine the effectiveness of the VET system and advise on the public and private returns on government and investment. This means better understanding VET student outcomes such as whether a student got a job and what they are now earning, as well as public benefits such as building a strong work workforce. This will enable governments to direct investment towards high-quality courses that give students the best chance of getting a job while strengthening our economy and society. Those opposite have claimed that the National Skills Commission is replication of Labor's policy. It is not. We are not recreating Australian National Training Authority or Australian Workforce and Productivity Agency or AWPA's precursor, Skills Australia. These agencies were designed for a very different time. The National Skills Commissioner would be tasked with using the advanced data analytics and real-time web-based information on the labour market to build a much stronger evidence base to inform VET investment and better understand the outcomes students achieve with VET. The analytics and information available to the Commissioner did not exist in the days of ANTA, Skilling Australia or AWPA. The bushfires and the COVID-19 crisis have highlighted how much information on economic activity is actually available and the importance of having a trusted, independent authority who can synthesise that information and sort the wheat from the chaff to ensure decision makers have access to right information at the right time. The role of the Commissioner is underpinned by the principles of independence, transparency and accountability. The Commissioner is a statutory position. The Commissioner will be appointed by the Minister following an open and transparent merit-based selection process in line with the Public Service Services Government's Merit and Transparency Policy. The maximum term of the appointment is up to five years to enable stability and consistency for the Commission. The Remuneration Tribunal will determine the Commissioner's pay and recreation leave. The Commissioner will be supported by departmental staff who as public servants will be made available by the Secretary of the Department of Education, Schools and Employment. Additional staff will be engaged to support the Commissioner's new core functions. The Minister is able to give direction by a legislative instrument to the Commissioner about the way in which the Commissioner is to carry out the Commissioner's functions, and any direction the Minister gives will be tabled in Parliament and made publicly available. This bill gives the Minister the power to appoint one or more advisory committees to support the Commissioner. This could provide an effective mechanism for industry and state and territory involvement. 
Mr Acting Deputy President, the coalition has a very good record on achievement on schools, particularly uh, on COVID-19 support. Through the $1.3 billion Supporting Apprentices and Training Initiative, support is being provided to small businesses to retain their apprentices through a 50 per cent wage subsidy up to 30 September 2020 and, as, a, as, a, as of 5 June uh, of this year, a total of 55,400 apprentices and trainees and 31,500 employers have been assisted by the by the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy, resulting in a total of $252 million in payments, and that does not include assistance under JobKeeper. The JobKeeper payment will also support many apprentices and trainees, trainees remaining connected to their employers as a result of the pandemic. In addition, significant regulatory and fee relief has been provided to the vocational education and training sector. Fees charged by uh, ASQA ASQA, will be refunded or waived. These measures put some $100 million back into the cash flow of Australian education and training businesses, so this money can be used to retain employees. New cost recovery arrangements for ASQA will also be deferred by 12 months to 1 June 2021. There will also be a six-month exemption from the loan fees associated with VET student loans in a bid to encourage full fee-paying students to continue their studies despite these difficult times. Mr Acting Deputy President, Australians haven't forgotten what Labor did to the VET sector when they were last in government. We are accused of having a poor and coherent sector by Senator Pratt and I can almost feel Senator Pratt channelling Senator Doug Cameron, except for the accent. Rather. Labor was responsible for a fall in apprentices in apprenticeships by 110,000 between July 2012 and June 2013, after they ripped out $1.2 billion in employer incentives, the largest ever annual decline. We are working with states and territories to reform the system and clean up the mess left by Labor. The government is investing uh, more in a better system. To commit more funding, we need to have confidence that the VET system will deliver what the economy needs. The coalition government is, committing, is committed to ensuring that we are equipping Australians with the skills they need for good, secure jobs. Mr Acting Deputy President, I recommend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Molan. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. So I, make, I rise to make contribution on the bill to establish a new statutory office, the National Skills Commissioner. Labor does not oppose the, this bill or the creation of this office, which will provide the Minister and the Secretary of the Department with advice on skills demand, labour market and workforce development issues. Labor has a track record of supporting and acting on expert policy advice and evidence on skills and workforce development. We established Skills Australia in 2008, which then became the Australian Workplace Productivity Agency in 2011. One of the first things the Abbott government did on taking office in April 2014 was, of course, to close it down. Since then, this government has systematically decimated vocational education and moved this country to a dangerous dependence on short-term temporary skilled migration. To rebuild our workforce, to change it from one that is planned simply around the wishes of a few large employers to one that serves our economy, we need independent data, and so Labor does not oppose this bill. But to fix the skills shortage, we need much more than someone in government department somewhere or an overpaid renovation reality TV star like Scott Cam. Without better leadership and investment in things like TAFE, this bill will just be window dressing, created for the benefit of government being able to appoint another one of its mates to a highly paid public service position. 
And to be clear, from all accounts, the person they have appointed to this position is a Liberal mate, a former Liberal staffer, Business Council of Australia economist. We all know where his loyalties lie. The government underspent on VET by nearly a billion dollars. Now they've been appointing representatives of big business to critical positions in vocational education and paying them, I suspect, half a million dollars a year for it. To fix this, though, firstly we need to rebuild what was once a world-class vocational educational sector. At a time when the government has let apprenticeships fall by 140,000 and presided over a national shortage of tradies, apprentices and trainees, they have slashed funding to TAFE and training by $3 billion and underspent their own budgets by another $1 billion. A further 100,000 apprentices and trainees will be lost by the end of the year if the government fails to take further action to keep current apprentices in jobs way beyond the steps taken so far, and further support employees even further to make sure that occurs. They currently have a wage subsidy in place to, for businesses to keep their existing apprentices, but like JobKeeper, it too expires in September. What will be left after September is what they are, the government is calling job maker. Well, it's better referred to as job faker. It's an announcement with no extra funding, no time frame and basically no detail. It's just more spin from Scotty from marketing. Australians need and deserve TAFEs and universities that are centres of excellence. And the, real, the Liberals have gutted both. At the same time, we have 2.6 million Australians either unemployed or looking for more hours of work. This will only increase when JobKeeper ends at September and JobSeeker goes back to its normal state. Business groups, like the Australian Industry Group, agree on that. They say the end of JobKeeper will result in a difficult, I quote, a difficult period of high risk, uncertainty and anxiety for businesses and households. Even the Liberal New South Wales Premier agrees. On June the 4th, she noted that the New South Wales were yet to absorb the full economic shock of COVID-19, saying the New South Wales was and I quote, staring down literally hundreds of thousands of extra people coming off JobKeeper and going straight onto the dole queue. Now urgently, vocational educational needs serious reform if it's going to continue to deliver the skills that Australian workers need. The government needs to consult, not just with big business mates, but with unions and all businesses. Cutting funding and appointing your mates while, looking, while locking workers out of the reform process is no way for the government to rebuild TAFE and vocational education. It also needs to integrate with the migration system. The government needs to go back to work and the recommendations of the report commissioned by the minister in 2014, which examined the 457 visa system. The report, titled Robust New Foundations, was completed by four eminently qualified panellists, including as chair John Azaris, and examined the integrity of the skilled migration system. It should inform policy development into the future. In 2012, the Minister for Immigration, Chris Bowen, acting on the recommendations of the report, convened the first Ministerial Advisory Council on Skilled Migration, MAC. SM, to provide the government with expert advice on the role of skilled migration in the Australian economy. MAS, MACSM is a tripartite body with representatives from unions, government and employers. It provided independent advice to help develop our migration policies and program in a way that was tailored to our real, present and future needs. Rather than letting our skilled migration system be run by a few large employers, this body was independent and reconciled the needs of business and future workforce needs with a need for long-term planning for the economy. And what did the Liberals do with it? 
or first they ignored it. When Turnbull replaced the 457 system, he did not discuss it with MACSM, the tripartite organisation. He completely bypassed it. Of course, had they bought the proposal, MACSM, they might have advised a different approach, a more thoughtful approach, an approach that was genuinely considered by everybody right across the economy. My Labor colleague Jed Kearney in the other place, Jed Kearney in the other place, who was then on the council, said at the time that she, and I quote, would have made it clear that the occupations that remain on this list, which include roof tilers, carpenters, joiners, chefs, cooks, midwives, nurses and real estate agents, do not accurately reflect the genuine labour shortages in Australia. Two of the important tasks of the Ministerial Council are to advise on. Firstly, skill shortages in the labour market, which cannot be met from domestic labour force and domestic training and education programs. And secondly, on policies to ensure that Australian workers are afforded priority in the labour market. This is to make finding Australians who can meet these skills gaps a priority of government. Mr Acting Deputy President, every single position on this board is vacant. This government, just like on climate change, does not want to listen to the experts. It just wants to select its Liberal mates. Instead of sitting down with workers, employers and labour market experts to get the skills mix right, the government simply ignores them. There are real consequences for the lack of action by this government on the skills market. It is young Australians who are missing out. They are not getting the opportunities to start new careers and get the support they need to succeed in the labour market. The COVID-19 pandemic will be the biggest challenge to our labour market in our lifetime. It is a defining moment and defining event for young people and their entering into jobs and careers. We owe it to them to do everything we can to ensure they get the chance we all have and had starting out in our own careers. I hope the Commission is successful in the next. Labor and government will build on this initiative to ensure that we are maximising our young people's potential for the, for, the nature, for the future of the nation. Thank you. Senator Antic. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to speak in support of the National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020. Now, those in this place uh, may know that I have already spoken in this place about the importance of a post-COVID-19 return for manufacturing opportunities in Australia, but of course particularly in my home state of South Australia. Under the visionary premiership of Sir Thomas Playford, South Australia was a manufacturing powerhouse. South Australia was clever and it knew how to take wartime industries and adapt them into a post-war world. Post-COVID-19, however, everything has changed and the job of rebuilding our economy is now ahead of us. And part of that rebuild involves the need to return manufacturing to our nation. Now, during his address to the National Press Club last month, the Prime Minister outlined the importance of a highly skilled workforce to support a modern, competitive and advanced manufacturing sector. Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill will establish a new statutory position, the National Skills Commissioner, and, sp and specify the functions of that commissioner. This is a vital element in the government's job maker plan, enabling us to navigate our economic recovery in this global economy. The Commissioner will provide independent expert advice and national leadership on the Australian labour market, the current and future skill needs and workforce development issues. The Commissioner will examine the cost drivers and develop and maintain a set of efficient processes for uh, VET courses to improve transparency, consistency and accessibility for students. So this role really couldn't be more timely as we address the critical challenges of managing the health 
and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the Productivity Commission's interim report suggests the government's view that the VET funding arrangements are currently flawed and overdue for replacement to address concerns of inconsistency and poorly designed function and a lack of transparency. Vocational Education and Training VET, uh, is one of the key career pathways and it can further improve our capacity to grow and compete and thrive in a global economy. Further noted in this report is that regardless of the extent to which state and territory governments adopt a common national approach to subsidies, there are strong grounds for them to use common methods to measure costs and determine loadings. There is no denying that the world, the market and the needs of the market have changed as a result of COVID-19. The Commissioner and the National Skills Commission will help prepare Australia's labour market for that recovery. They will establish a robust new evidence base to strengthen the Australian education and training system. And as the economy evolves, we do, we do need to ensure that jobs and training and the training associated are relevant to the jobs that will be available as they come out in this crisis. And this is why the Morrison government has identified skills and training as a priority in the JobMaker plan so that the government is investing in the right skills at the right time. This will help us to close the gaps in the market and provide confidence to employers, to students and tertiary educators that we are providing a consistently trained and competent labour force. Australia's economic recovery will be particularly reliant on highly skilled, resilient and, adapt and adaptable workforce. The skills needs of the economy are likely to evolve and the jobs that will be made as we come out of the crisis may well not be the same as those uh, predating the crisis. So the Commissioner will provide um, detailed labour market analysis, including an annual report each year setting out the skill needs for Australia. And the Commission will publish close to real-time data on labour markets to, to flag emerging skills shortages and other labour market trends. Using this data, we will be able to provide students with the most accurate and comprehensive data on where jobs will actually be and what qualifications they will need in order to secure them. This will help show that trade and skill jobs are ones to be aspired to, and ones to be aspired to as a first best option, not looked down upon or seen as a second best option um, in favour of a university degree. And it builds on the government's $585 million delivering skills for today and tomorrow skills package and also contributes to COAG's agreed vision for VET to be a responsive, dynamic and trusted sector. Together with the National Vocation, uh, Vocational Education Training Regulator Amendment Bill 2020, this bill uh, delivers some of the key elements of the 2019 Expert Review of Australia's VET system, led by the Hon. Stephen Joyce. The Morrison government is committed to driving improvement in the quality, relevance and accessibility of the VET system to underpin Australia's economic recovery. This is important, and it's important because COVID-19 has actually exposed certain deficiencies or shortcomings in our strategic autonomy, and it's shone a spotlight on the matters that I touched on earlier, being the urgent need to return uh, some form of additional manufacturing uh, capacity to our shores. So for this reason, earlier this year I started a campaign to bring back local manufacturing to South Australia. And it's my view, of course, in all matters, in order to best represent the needs of that particular sector or industry, uh, it's important to be listening to their needs. Um, it's important to be able to do that to enable us to adapt in this post-COVID-19 world and adapt to the new challenges these industries will face as well. So to assist in, in that understanding um, and understanding the needs of the manufacturing com community, particularly in my home state of South Australia, I have spent several weeks visiting those businesses to try to understand their needs and try to understand the needs of the industry and the ways in which uh, we in this place 
can help provide more opportunities and incentives to bring manufacturing back home. Last month, in fact, I visited the facilities and production lines of um, a company from South Australia called Packpot Manufacturing. Now, Packpot are an impressive South Australian company in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, producing plastic packaging containers for a range of different industries. They've invested in state-of-the-art machinery, allowing them to produce high-quality and efficient um, packaging. They've developed state-of-the-art designs and tooling, which allow them to manufacture plastic products which are highly sought after in the market. I was shown their extraordinary systems, which have been set up to ensure that this process can take place. The, the machinery itself and the processes are highly advanced, and they require employees with advanced training. And they also require employees with the skills to operate these machines and to operate those processes. And this is absolutely critical. The National Skills Commission will aid businesses like Packpot to continue to be world leaders and to do so from the safety of our shores. I also was given a tour of facilities operated by Novafast Systems. And Novafast Systems are producers of innovative pipe solutions and composite equipment pr production, providing equipment to all sorts of sectors, uh, the oil, defence, marine, gas, mining and industrial sectors. Uh, established in 1999, they're a proud South Australian company and they're proof that Australian and South Australian manufacturing businesses can flourish on the national and the world stages. They're another example of how Australian know-how in providing jobs, intellectual property and capacity to the market is absolutely achievable for Australian businesses. Now, I was also pleased to visit the manufacturing facilities of Axiom Precision Manufacturing, also in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And of course, it's important because South Australia, as we all know in this place, is the defence capital of this country. Yeah, a bit of um, defence projects, of course, of this nature <laughs> require defence based manufacturing skills, and companies like Axiom Precision Manufacturing are great examples of South Australian SMEs which are rising to the challenge of providing advanced manufacturing solutions. They're providing precision machined parts, tooling and injection moulding moulded components to high standards, and they are yet more proof that South Australia can provide superior solutions and, once again, importantly, manufacturing them all from the security and surrounds of my home state. And these businesses are just a small cross-section of the businesses in South Australia which show what we all know, that Australian businesses are well placed to both compete on the world scene by providing world-leading products through advanced manufacturing and to play a critical role in the rebuilding of Australia's manufacturing base. Those businesses and many future South Australian and Australian businesses will lead that charge in the rebuild and they will lead the way for other complementary businesses to play their part in what will be a strategic rebuilding of our sovereign manufacturing capability. We need to build it here. There's no reason why this country can't play a, a large part and South Australia play an even larger part in the industrial and manufacturing renaissance of this country. We have a growing defence sector and one of the largest health science precincts in the Southern Hemisphere, not to mention the National Space Agency. Advanced manufacturing is a growth area. And it's an area to be fostered using these sectors as leverage. The National Skills Commission, therefore, is not just about jobs. It's about protecting our sovereign interests. Like many of you, the sight of pallets of important medical and personal protective equipment being shipped back to China by companies with links to the Chinese Communist Party at the time of the medical crisis may prove to be the most important lesson we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we move forward in our economic recovery, we must not forgive, forget these lessons. We can no longer be reliant solely on other nations or on authoritarian regimes like the Chinese Communist Party. Australia is a resource-rich country. However, the previous few decades have seen our manufacturing base placed under great pressure. This bill is a step in the right direction to ensuring that Australians have the right skills for the workforce of today and, of course, the workforce of tomorrow. So I commend the government for acting quickly to ensure that we support local businesses and manufacturing opportunities post-COVID-19. 
It's a proud moment to be a member of the Morrison government, the true party of the workers, the true party of small business, and I commend the bill. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Walsh. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, this government's record on TAFE training and skills can be summed up with two words, cuts and neglect. And it is workers and businesses that have paid the price. This government has cut billions from TAFE. It has cut millions from universities. And it has overseen the loss of 140,000 apprenticeships and trainees. And this has been at the same time as business has, has cried out for skilled workers and everyday Australians are crying out for jobs. In this country, we have a serious mismatch between the skills that workers have to offer and the skills that businesses need. Before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, almost two million Australians were unable to find enough work. But at the same time, nearly three quarters of businesses were saying that they couldn't find workers with the skills that they need. So even before the pandemic and recession, we were facing a jobs and skills crisis in Australia. Now, 2.6 million Australians are unemployed or underemployed, a number that is, of course, predicted to rise over the coming months. Uh, and if you look at the government's own skills shortages list, you'll find uh, that we're lacking people with the skills to be early childhood educators, car mechanics, midwives, electricians, bakers, nurses, teachers, and many more. So why is it that kids finishing school today can't count on this government to deliver them the skills and training that they need to fill these vacancies? How is it that we've got to a situation where we have high unemployment, high regional unemployment, high youth unemployment, and at the same time we can't train Australia's young people for these absolutely core essential jobs? Well, the answer is cuts and neglect from this government. The National Skills Commissioner won't do enough to fix the mess that this government has created. We are facing one of the greatest economic transformations of our lifetimes, uh, and the speed of that transformation will only increase um, with this pandemic. Uh, and we have choices as a nation about how we deal with that. Uh, and the choice is, do we continue down this government's path, um, a path uh, of record cuts and of neglect, um, a path that lacks ambition for working Australians? Or do we actually seize this opportunity? Uh, and if we seize this opportunity, what we're going to need is a government that actually plans for tomorrow's economy, one that is focused on creating good and secure jobs and ensuring that Australians have the skills to do them and that they're supported to get those skills through a quality and robust TAFE training and university sector. Now, the government has de demonstrated that it can barely plan for today's economy, let alone tomorrow's, because even before COVID-19 hit, this government had over 2 million Australians either unemployed or underemployed while at the same time businesses were saying that they needed people now. Uh, and this is now, of course, 2.6 million workers. Uh, and it's young people who are really doing it tough, who, who really uh, have got it particularly bad under this Morrison government. They were already struggling for opportunities before COVID-19, but now the youth unemployment rate has hit almost 14%. Uh, and in some regional parts of Australia, youth unemployment is as high as 24 per cent. Many of the industries that have been hardest hit by the shutdowns in the health uh, response to COVID-19, sectors like retail and hospitality, are large employers of young people. And many young people have struggled to find a place at university or at TAFE uh, in recent years. Uh, and why is that? Well, it's because this government has inflicted cuts and underspends on our TAFE training and university sectors. From TAFE alone, the government have cut $3 billion and underspent their own budget by another $1 billion. 
Apprentice numbers have already fallen by 140,000 since this government took office. And if the government doesn't take action, apprenticeship numbers are predicted to fall by another 100,000 by the end of this year. That would mean a 35 per cent drop in numbers in this year alone. And we all know that we are going to need skilled workers to recover from this recession and that people desperately need good, secure jobs that are supported by quality training. Now, it's one thing for the government to announce construction projects and $150,000 bathroom renovations, but they're actually going to need people to do the work to build these 150,000 renovations, just as we need nurses in our hospitals, just as we need carers in our nursing homes, just as we need early childhood, educa early childhood educators, electricians, mechanics. Uh, and these workers come from our TAFE system uh, and also from our university sector, two sectors that have been absolutely hung out to dry by the Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison government. So, we support reliable analysis of our labour market and skills needs. Uh, that's a good idea, and we hope that the National Skills Commissioner uh, will provide that analysis. But what is the government going to do with the information that they get from the National Skills Commissioner? What are they going to do when the Commissioner reports that there's a skills shortage that needs to be filled? Uh, only to find out that TAFEs and universities no longer have the capacity to train in those areas. Australians deserve excellent TAFEs and universities. Uh, they have pride in our TAFEs and universities, but the Liberals have gutted both sectors. Uh, and right now they're doing nothing to protect universities and TAFEs from the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, and from the shutdowns uh, that it has created. And this is incredibly short-sighted um, because in the university sector alone, we know that courses are being cancelled, campuses are shutting, and 21,000 jobs are currently at risk. Uh, and instead, what is the government focusing on? They're spending their time announcing plans that are all talk and no substance, plans that are so light on any detail that you can't really call them plans at all. Job maker. I mean, what is it? What is job maker? We don't really know. And when the government first announced this plan without a plan a few weeks ago, uh, the Prime Minister slammed the training sector uh, as unresponsive. And perhaps when he did that, he forgot that uh, his team had been in government for the past seven years uh, and that he's in fact talking about his own failures. And it's this government that has been unresponsive to the needs of Australians for good quality training and for decent, secure jobs. Uh, and if he was so concerned that the sector wasn't working, why did it take a global pandemic for him to make any announcements about it to, to finally turn his attention to it? Uh, and perhaps he could try to do better uh, than a phony announcement with no time frame, no extra funding and essentially no detail at all. When the coalition took government, they vacated the field on this issue. And so the creation of the National Skills Commissioner is really just a tweak when we actually need major and real reform. We support the need for analysis of our labour market and we absolutely support making policy based on expert advice. Uh, but the National Skills Commissioner essentially replaces the Australian Workplace Productivity Agency, which this government scrapped in 2014. Six years ago, six years wasted, six years wasted while other countries are doing the right thing and investing heavily into skills and education while we get left behind. And as usual, with this government, uh, this is just too little, too late. Um, it's not a plan, just like the job maker program isn't a plan. And a government without a plan for education and skills is really a government without a plan for our future. And even more concerning, it screams of, uh, screams of a government without a plan for our economic recovery as well. Now, right now, in our first recession for almost 30 years, uh, we need a government that is serious about creating good, decent, secure jobs. 
We need a government that assesses its decisions by whether they create decent, well-paid work for all. That is what Australians need going forward. And we need a government that provides Australians with the skills that they need to do those jobs. And the Labor team is focused on this. The Labor team has always been focused on this. Uh, and in fact, it was, in, it was last October that the Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, announced our intention of establishing Jobs and Skills Australia. This will be an independent statutory authority that provides a genuine partnership with business leaders, state and territory governments, unions and education providers. Um, it will bring everybody together to make sure that workers have access to the skills and jobs that they need and that business have access to the skilled workers that they are seeking as well. This will be a model of genuine partnership and collaboration investing in the skills of Australian workers. And we need this now more than ever as we look towards our recovery post-COVID-19. Uh, so on this side of the chamber, we have a vision for decent and stable jobs supported by quality training. This is absolutely in our DNA and we are already there. We see education as an investment in our future and we will always support hardworking Australians who want a quality education. We will always support good, secure jobs for all Australians. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, President, beg your pardon. It is getting late in the hour, isn't it? Uh, I too rise to speak on this bill, and I'm I suppose a little perplexed by uh, what Senator Walsh was saying, although I shouldn't be surprised when she says that she doesn't know what job making is, because I suppose uh, Labor are just good at decimating jobs, and so it's a little wonder why uh, the concept of a job maker is something that uh, those opposite struggle to really get their head around. But uh, look, to the matter at hand, I, I, uh, I take great pleasure in standing up speaking on this bill. Uh, it's very important. Uh, my background before coming into this place was all about creating jobs, getting people into jobs and, importantly, keeping them in jobs. In the environment uh, we find ourselves in today, such a position has never been so important for our nation. As we embark on the recovery phase of the coronavirus challenge, a measure of our success will be the focus we have on workforce training and development and how our training and education systems respond to what will be significant demand from Australian industry as they rehire, retrain and get people back into work. Now, I come into this place as a self-confessed senator for jobs. I've spent my entirety of my working life working with people, uh, and most, uh, most have been uh, some of the most disadvantaged Australians, those with some of the highest possible barriers to employment. I've helped them gain meaningful employment and into long-term sustainable jobs. But before I get to the substance of this bill, just let me touch on why it is so important. Prior to coming into this place, I was the Chief Operating Officer of Generation One, an initiative many in this place would be familiar with in that it's created uh, over 50,000 jobs for Indigenous Australians. We turned the training and employment system upside down. Typically, someone out of work would go to Centrelink to register for payments. Centrelink would then send them to an employment services provider and they'd undertake training in a particular discipline. Now, more often than not, they'd end up with more training book uh, tickets than a raffle book, uh, none of which usually result in finding a job, sadly. And then they'll start the process again, all as part of their mutual obligations. Now, under Generation One, our model was originally pioneered by Fortescue Metals Group and trialled in Fitzroy Crossing, and it became the template for the Vocational Training and Employment Centres program. We started with an employer who had a job. We designed the training around the requirements and guaranteed the individual a job before they commenced. And what was the result? When a job seeker could see the course that they were doing was actually going to lead to something, the change in their lives was immense. At the outset, it was clear that the standards were going to be very high. They had to show commitment and they had to turn up 
on time. And boy, did these training participants rise to the occasion. In fact, in my first speech, I spoke about this, and I noted that some 70 per cent of those that uh, completed the course, started in the job, were still in that job uh, six months later. 70 per cent were still employed some six months later. This was about three times the national average of similar programs. And this is what's required. When you stay in a job for this long as an individual, you see the changes not only in your lives uh, but those of your family as well. Your lifestyle will change, new habits will be formed and you'll start to see the impact on families and the broader community. The change is systemic. And this is where our focus will be, because I believe that too many of the challenges we face, whether they are in our remote regional centres or communities or in our cities, stem from unemployment. We do say that the best form of welfare is a job. It's not rhetoric. It's something that we know to be absolutely true. Well, I've been privileged to see the reality and the practical effect on this on countless numbers of lives. When you lift people up so that they can see over the horizon, when they earn their first paycheck, when they see that they can independently support their family and take part in all the advantages that the 21st century life offers, then this transformation is truly quite life-changing. Thought uh, it's true that uh, job, though it's true, beg your pardon, that, that a job doesn't change everything, without it, nothing will change. This is why I'm proud to be a part of a government which has consistently overseen job creation since coming into office. And now, in today's climate, our focus on jobs will be absolutely critical. As I've said, it will be our measure of success. And a new era of thinking is required, a new way of consultation with industry, our vocational education and providers and our universities is absolutely critical, a new way of bringing together all the different programs and initiatives that exist around the nation and making them all work together as an effective and efficient pipeline. And that's what the National Skills Commissioner will do. The role is a critical new piece of Australia's economic infrastructure. It will complement and support the Prime Minister's recently announced job maker plan, enabling us to navigate economic recovery, lifting productivity and laying the foundations for a prosperous future. It's going to enable us to get back on track. The Commissioner will provide independent expert advice and national leadership on the Australian labour market, current and future skills and workforce development issues. The functions as set out in this bill will support a stronger, more agile vocational education and training system in a number of ways. And let me take you through them. Firstly, the Commissioner will consolidate and strengthen labour market and skills needs analysis to provide an independent and trusted source of information about what is happening now and, importantly, into the future. The innovative use of new data sources and advanced data analytic techniques will support the Commissioner in becoming a trusted source of, of sophisticated labour market information analysis and forecasting. This is critical so that we can ensure that training is matching the needs of industry, so that we're not just training for training's sake, but we're actually training people for jobs that exist and that are needed for the labour market. This research and analysis will draw on emerging data sources and cutting-edge analytical techniques to ensure Australia's labour market analysis capability is world-leading. It will help close skills gaps and provide confidence to employers, students, tertiary educators and Australian governments that we are investing in the right skills at the right time. This is essential to prepare Australians for the workforce opportunities of today and of tomorrow. Secondly, the Commissioner will examine the cost drivers and develop and maintain a set of efficient prices for VET courses to improve transparency, consistency and accessibility for students. Currently, VET prices and subsidies vary considerably around Australia, with students paying different prices for the same course and facing various varying levels of quality. For example, there is currently a difference of $11,745 in subsidies between Western Australia and Queensland for students studying a Diploma of Nursing. And it's not clear 
what is driving this. There are a number of similar examples between other states. So core to the Commissioner's pricing will be consideration of quality. An efficient price does not mean necessarily the lowest price, but one that provides value for money. It means that the price that needs to be paid to ensure to secure training that delivers the skills that employers need and sets the student up for a valuable career. And finally, the Commissioner will lead research and analysis to examine the effectiveness of the VET system and advise on the public and private returns on government investment. This means better understanding of VET student outcomes, such as whether a student got a job and what they are now earning, as well as public benefits such as building a strong care workforce. This will enable governments to direct investment towards high quality courses that give students the best chance of getting a job, while strengthening our economy and our society. Now, those opposite like to think that they have the monopoly on jobs. They have some archaic vision in their mind uh, about that they're all about trades and skills. It's almost like they're still out on the union beat. But if there is any indication that they've lost the magic touch that they thought they had with everyday hard-working Australians, it was at the last election. The Australian people know who backs them. They know, they know who wants them to succeed, to see them succeed, Beg your pardon, and they know who will give them the tools to do so. And it's not those sitting opposite. In fact, you haven't had their backs for a long time. Now, there has been some claims made in the public arena and in this debate. So let's make something clear. We are not recreating Australian National Training Authority, ANTA, or the Australian Workforce Productivity Agency or its precursor, Skills Australia. These agencies were designed for a different time. We are in a new era and it has been uh, uh, more, even more so uh, pertinent because of the crisis, the coronavirus crisis that we are dealing with. The National Skills Commission will be tasked with using the advanced data analytics and real-time web-based information on the labour market to bring a much stronger evidence base to inform VET investment and better understand the outcomes students achieve from VET. The analytics and information available to the Commissioner did not exist in the days of ANTA, Skilling Australia or, or AWPA. The bushfires and the coronavirus crisis have highlighted how much important information on economic activity is available and the importance of having a trusted, independent authority who can synthesise that information to ensure that decision makers have access to right information at the right time. This is just another demonstration of our commitment to Australian jobs and homegrown skills. In 2019-20, we're investing over $3 billion in VET. $3 billion in VET, which will include 1.5 given to the states and territories every year through the National Agreement on Skills and Workforce Development. It will be $1.1 million billion to fund the government's own skills programs, $175 million to the states and territories via the Skilling Australians Funds to support increased apprenticeships and traineeship numbers. And despite all of the commentary from those opposite, people haven't forgotten about what you did to our skills and training system. People have not forgotten about the VET fee help scheme. And I met many people that felt completely ripped off as I, in my career by that scheme and uh, were really set back as a result of it. It was just another program of a long list of failed labour schemes. Just another example of pretending to deliver for people that you claim to represent. Under your government, dodgy providers flourished. Students were systemically exploited, signed up to accumulate huge debts for training packages that were never delivered. Never delivered. And we had to fix up your mess. Since 2016, over 91,000 students have had vet fee help loans, debts of over $1.5 billion credited by the Commonwealth Government. We have introduced VET student loans so that students can access financial support to gain their qualification, safe in the knowledge that they will not be ripped off. But that's not all. Labor responsible for a fall in apprenticeships by 110,000 between July 12 to June 2013, after they ripped out 
$1.2 billion in employer incentives, the largest ever annual decline. And we are fixing this. The government is investing more in a better system. The next step, as enabled by this role, will allow us to deliver more targeted funding. It is to have confidence that the VET system will deliver what the economy needs what employers need so that they can not only provide jobs for those people but create even more jobs. This is what this commissioner and this role will enable this economy to be able to achieve. And that's what the National Skills Commissioner will do, along with the support of their team. I don't think there's anyone in this place, aside maybe from Senator Cash herself, that is more enthusiastic about this bill, maybe others, but I am absolutely passionate about this because it is absolutely necessary. We know it to be true. Just ask any employer out there that has demand for skills, that has demand for people that can actually do the job with the skills, that can operate with the competence that's required, and that importantly are safe and can go home to their families because they have the requisite skills and the knowledge to do it. I can't wait until the office is in place and I look forward to working with the Commissioner to deliver better outcomes for all Australians, particularly those in regional and remote WA. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support this bill. We need, though, to do far more. We need to get manufacturing moving. We need to protect Australia from the risks of sources of imported goods drying up. And we need, as Senator Sullivan has said, jobs, jobs, jobs. Queenslanders and Australians everywhere have heard us speak about the gaps in our productive capacity, the gaps in our economic resilience, the gaps in our economic sovereignty, and the gaps in our national security. That was before COVID. Now it's even more so, especially since COVID revealed that we did not even have enough personal protective equipment to protect our valued healthcare workers and everyday Australians. And now we have to store our own oil, our own oil in the USA because we have nowhere to store it here. And at first we couldn't even, after COVID, we couldn't even manufacture ventilators. But thanks to Aussie ingenuity and a personal thank you to all those innovative Australians who did step up to fill this gap. Certainly, we need the skills. Australia needs the skills and the capability to ensure that we can protect ourselves from future health disasters and economic disasters, especially things like the prolonged border closures of, or international transport closures or blockades, cut to seed transport. And these are possibilities. We see the news of what's happening in the South China Seas. We see the, the growing confrontation between America and China. We need to think about our security. So this government has presented a bill for the creation of the position of National Skills Commissioner. Yet we need to ensure this is not just an advisory role. Just setting up this office for four years is costing taxpayers over $48 million. And I quite often hear Liberal and Labor people and the Nationals saying, we've spent a million here, we've spent tens of millions here, we've spent hundreds of millions here, we've spent a couple of billion here and there. It's not the money that matters, it's the environment in which that money uh, can be turned into something beneficial for the people of Australia. So we expect a return on that $48 million, a return on investment by giving the Commissioner the teeth to ensure that vocational training across Australia is high in quality, consistent and competitively priced. Training by itself is not the answer. It needs to be good, effective training. So where is the accountability between the federal funding of approximately $1.5 billion a year to the states, to the vocational providers? to ensure that our vocational trainees get a high quality education and an affordable education that really lands them a job. If the government is going to invest $1.5 billion per year in vocational education and training, then Australians have a right to ensure that our taxes are well spent. So we need a review of the performance of the National Skills Commissioner after 12 months or possibly after three years. We need that review. We also need to understand that it is not the Commissioner who is going to get us effective training. It is not the Commissioner who is going to decide what skills are needed. Government, Liberal, Labor, Nationals 
have shown a very poor track record of anticipating demand for specific skills. Those decisions must be based upon what the market needs. It's the men and women in, in work, it's the men and women investing, men and women leading corporations that determine the skills we need. And actually, going beneath that, it's the market that drives those skills. And they will tell us what skills are needed to service the market. More importantly, we need to restart manufacturing in our country. And that needs more than training. It needs much more than training. It needs an integrated approach, an industry and economic environment which enables and encourages Australian investment. How the hell can people afford to invest when energy prices are so high? How the hell can it be that we don't have reliable, affordable, stable, synchronous electricity? We have the cheapest coal in the world, the highest quality coal in the world. We export that to China, and they produce coal far, far more cheaply at about 40 per cent. They sell it to their manufacturers at 40 per cent of the price we sell it. Why? Because our electricity prices have doubled in the last 10 years. Why? Because of Liberal Labor National's policies based on rubbish, a climate scam. That is what's destroying our manufacturing industry. Labor, labor costs are a smaller component of manufacturing these days than they used to be. Electricity prices are significant. We've gone from the lowest price electricity to the world's highest prices. And that's been due to regulations based not on data but on opinions from Liberal, Labor and National governments. How can it be that China takes our coal thousands of kilometres and sells it at 40 per cent of the price that we sell it for? It's regulations. It's government, government screwing with the market. It's government screwing with regulations. Listen to some of these factors, all government-driven. Government the renewable energy target introduced by John Howard's government. The national electricity market introduced before John Howard, if memory serves me correctly, but worsened under John Howard's government. National energy market is really a racket, not a market. And that's the people in Australia are paying for the price of that. The retail margins are guaranteed in some states at high, at high levels with very little risk. The networks are gold-plated because of regulations. And then we've got privatisation. In Queensland, our state, the Labor, Labor Party up there in the state government uses that as a tax. $1.4 to $1.5 billion a year in tax due to excess charges from the generators. Privatisation, the sale of assets, is, is failing around the country. That is an essential asset and it's crippling our manufacturing. It's crippling jobs right across agriculture. Farmers won't, won't irrigate because the price of water is too high. Price of pumping water is too high. Second thing, tax. That's part of the business environment. Multinationals in our country are going without paying tax, any company tax, due to agreements from Robert Menzies' Liberal government in 1953, perpetuated with the lack of tax on on the northwest shelf gas that was enabled by Bob Hawke's Labor government in the 1980s. Both sides have done that. Former Deputy Commissioner of Taxation Jim Kalali said in 1996 and the year, to, and the year 2010 that 90 per cent of Australia's large companies are foreign owned and since 1953 have paid little or no tax. What that means is that mums and dads Families, small businesses, Australian-owned businesses have to pay more tax than they need to. It also means that the Australian businesses are at a competitive disadvantage of about 30 per cent because they have to pay company tax and large companies have to pay company tax and uh, the foreign companies don't. So taxation, we need to set a level playing field by taxing multinationals and reducing the tax burden, simplifying the tax system, having a comprehensive review of tax, because that is one of the most important factors driving the lack of investment from Australians. We also have an abundance of regulations that are crippling, that is crippling our country. We have red tape from the bureaucracies at state, federal and even local level. We have green tape driven by, uh, by rampant environmentalists. We have blue tape driven by UN, and that is arguably the largest component of tape, the blue tape, most expensive of all. 
put in place by Liberal Labor Nationals governments. And then we have economic management. How can companies prepare, how can companies plan for the longer term, which is needed these days, when we have governments making, making economic management decisions purely based upon electoral, uh, electoral payoffs, not just every three years, as it used to be, but now it's an annual cycle. Budgets are based upon bribing, bribing uh, taxpayers to vote for that particular party. Economic management is now a 12-month issue and it's very short term and it's counterproductive to good business environment. We have states now with lower accountability because competitive federalism has been white ended The Queensland Labor government can sit on closing its borders and decimating our tourism, decimating small business in our state. And why? Because under the, the Commonwealth Com Constitution we are supposed to have competitive federalism. And yet in 1943 the income tax was stolen from the states and given to the federal government. And now essentially more than 50 per cent of state government expenditure is from the federal government, tied to federal government uh, conditions and guidelines. Which means effectively that the federal government is running much of what the states do. The federal government is running much of what the local councils do around, around Queensland and around Australia. I was in the Boulogne Shire Council in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2017, in February, and they told me in answer to a question of mine that 73 per cent of their annual revenue comes from the federal government with strings attached. Not only does the federal government tell them how to manage their, their local community, the federal government only has three to five year windows, which means the, the local councils can't go beyond that time frame in doing their planning. How can, how can local councils make a long term plan? This is what's hampering governance in this country. So I plead with the government to make sure that we focus on our economic productive capacity, our economic resilience, our economic sovereignty, our economic security, our economic independence, which has been smashed by the, well, the quest for the, the elitist quest for uh, inter interdependence, which is really depending upon others. That is a loss of dependence. Nonetheless, this legislation will help all Queenslanders to improve our state's economy and to repay the debt hole in which Labor government in Queensland has buried Queenslanders. We need training, but we need jobs. We need Australian jobs. We need Queensland jobs, especially in re regional Queensland. Training is a minor component, yet an important component. Beyond that, we need to get back to basics to create the economic environment to drive the Australian investment. As I said, I'll say it again, we need economic productive capacity to be restored. We need economic resilience to be restored. We need economic sovereignty and independence to be restored. We need economic security to be restored. Australia has the people, has the resources, has the opportunity, has the potential. We just need to get back to what we had, get back to the basics. And in the basics, Australia led the world in per capita gross domestic product, per capita income in the early years of our federation, when our constitution was followed and the states behaved competitively toward each other. That's what we need to get back to, a productive environment. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's good to hear from another Queensland senator tonight about some of the issues facing uh, skills in Queensland. And um, through you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll just um, uh, congratulate um, uh, the other fellow um, senator for bringing up so many issues around uh, manufacturing and skills and privatisation even, because we know some of the best and brightest apprentices in Queensland are some of our Ergon electrician apprentices, and we want to make sure that we do not privatise our electricity assets because we would not have those apprentices there. But tonight I want to speak a little bit more about the National Skills Commissioner Bill. There has never been a more important time for this country to make sure that we have the skills for the future so we can recover and rebuild after the coronavirus pandemic. While the Prime Minister is out there making announcements about bringing forward infrastructure, something Labor has been calling for before this pandemic, we are in a skills crisis. We've got slogans about how much infrastructure we're going to build, but we don't have the skills to build it. 
And we have a government with a track record of killing skills, underfunding TAFE and ignoring young people. Although Labor supports this bill, we urge the government to step up to the plate and build a skills system that will deliver skills that we need and the jobs that young Australians deserve. But as I indicated, I'd like to speak about the skills crisis facing regional Queensland at the moment. When it comes to apprentices and trainees, the Morrison government is failing North Queensland, and new modelling suggests that it's likely to get much worse. According to Department of Education data, in Townsville, the member for Herbert Philip Thompson's electorate, there has been a massive drop of 35.88 per cent of apprentices, or 1,200 fewer apprentices and trainees since the Liberal National Government came to power in 2013. In Mackay, the member for Dawson, George Christensen, has seen his electorate suffer the steepest drop in the state, with 77.4.6 per cent, or 1,453 less apprentices and trainees since September 2013. In the federal electorate of Leichhardt, uh, um, Cairns, where I live, MP Warren Ench has already overseen a massive drop of 28.66 per cent, or 932 apprentices and trainees, since the Liberal National Government came to power in 2013. And that's according to Department of Education data. In the federal seat of Kennedy, we've seen another significant drop of 46.16 per cent. It's clear from these numbers that North Queensland has suffered a large drop in apprentices and trainees, falling from 17,837 in September 2013 to 9,575 now. This drastic fall will come on top of the 20,000 apprentices and trainees Queensland is expected to lose this year. That's according to new modelling from the National Australia Apprenticeship Association. We are due to lose 20,000 apprentices and trainees in Queensland just this year alone. And we know that the Liberal National Government has created this trade crisis by presiding over cuts to TAFE, including $1 billion of underspending. Suffering TAFEs in regional Queensland deserve better. The government has had seven years to work with the states and territories to improve vocational education system and associated outcomes, but it's failed to do so. And this is happening. This skills crisis is happening at the same time that youth unemployment is going up. Figures released by the ABS reveal that 14.7 per cent of regional, young regional Queenslanders are now without work. Higher. Well, if you don't want to hear statistics, I'll take that interjection, but this is a particularly important one, Minister Colbeck, because it is 13.8 per cent of young people that are unemployed in Australia, and I do believe that that's your responsibility to deal with, but so far I haven't heard a contribution from you in this place that talked about how you're going to actually assist young people. All we've heard from the Minister for Youth was a declaration that he was going to cut red tape to help young people. Well, I can tell you that young people out there, I, I listen to everything you say, and I know that young people are not being listened to by this government. Youth unemployment in Cairns has jumped 2.5 per cent since the last year. It's now 12.1 per cent. And in Townsville, it has reached a shocking 16.4 per cent. That's young people without work. That's not a statistic. Those are people looking for jobs. So how does the LNP fix a skills crisis in regional Queensland? When they're faced with an issue like this and when they're faced with youth unemployment, what do they do? What, how do they go about fixing a crisis? Well, before the last election, these numbers, these skills crisis, was evident in places in regional Queensland. So the federal government sought to fix this skills crisis in far north Queensland, not by creating more apprentices or supporting trainees, putting a plan together to make sure that people were employed in good jobs so they could have apprenticeships. They entered into a designated area migration agreement with the Cairns Chamber of Commerce. Now, my criticism of this agreement isn't a criticism of the Chamber. 
They are working with what they have been given. It's a criticism that asks, you know, why we needed a Dharma in the first place to fix a skills gap in regional Queensland if the government had planned ahead and invested in the skills we need and if the government was doing something to fix youth unemployment. Although an announcement was made in the days before the last election, the details of the scheme were not released by the local member, Warren Ench. All we had before the election was a press release. We didn't actually have the details of the Dharma. So people in far north Queensland did not get to see the agreement before the election. They didn't get to understand exactly how extensive this agreement was. We've got the details of the agreement now, and the Dharma provides for 200 migrant worker visas per year. We have significant industries in far north Queensland that are suffering from a skills crisis under this government. So it is understandable that some occupations might need to access a scheme like this. We, we concede that. But here is the list of occupations that are covered by the Dharma in far north Queensland. It is a list of 70 occupations under this agreement. And again, I'm not criticising the chamber, but this is a list that shows the extent of our skills crisis. If I go through some of these lists, some of the occupations are an aged care disability worker, aircraft maintenance engineer, building associate. There's 70 here, so there's a lot to go through. Um, but we've also got electronic instrument trades worker. That's the extent of the skills crisis in far north Queensland. We've got to put that occupation on a dharma. Met metal fitters and machinists, motor mechanics, small engine mechanics. You know, sometimes people will say, well, of course we need um, skilled migration in places like far north Queensland, because we do have a, a tourism industry that needs um, specialist people working as uh, dive operators, um, as chefs, um, working in restaurants. Um, but this is an extensive list, and it did um, surprise me to see one of the other skills that is on this list is vocational education teacher. We don't even have vocational education teachers in far north Queensland under this government. They've had to put it on the Dharma. Some of those occupations also have concessions for skills and languages. So they've had concessions attached to those occupations. They don't have to meet those requirements. That's understandable in some circumstances. But there's also a concession in place called the TSMIT. And when I saw this abbreviation, I wasn't quite sure what it meant, but it's the Temporary Skilled Migration Income Threshold. And it's a salary that's set at $53,900, and above which temporary skilled migrants must be paid. As the ABC explained, occupation lists, labour market testing and equivalent salaries for migrants in local jobs all help support the integrity of visas. But the temporary skill migration income threshold is the core mechanism preventing the import, importation of migrant workers on lower wages. It is the core mechanism that stops migrant workers being imported into far north Queensland on lower wages than what local workers would be being paid. And it is the core mechanism that is meant to stop jobs going to people other than local workers or young people. The threshold has been held at the same level since 2003, meaning it hasn't risen with, uh, with um, living costs, but the concession is a discount. Now, under the Dharma, they essentially can pay people less under this agreement. And again, you would, you would think that there are some occupations that this government thinks is worth being paid less than what the threshold is. It's okay getting a concession. I guess you would think that maybe one or two of the list of 70 should apply for this threshold. But 62, 62 of the 70 occupations are eligible for this concession, meaning they do not have to pay an income equivalent to other visa requirements. 62 occupations are able to get away with not paying the migrant threshold income. In year two of the scheme, variations have been sought from the Department of Home Affairs, 
to include additional occupations and more concessions as Dharma is in place in far north Queensland. It's shocking that this government thinks that this is the solution to our skills crisis in far north Queensland. To put together an agreement and allow extensive occupations to be added to that agreement, to allow concessions, to allow people to be paid less than what local workers would be paid. They're not going to go out there and fund TAFE the way they should be. They're not going to go out there and give money to the Great Barrier Reef International Marine College, a fantastic TAFE facility in Cairns, where we train people like dive operators who are listed on the Dharma. Instead, they're going to use this Dharma to fill the gaps that they have created by failing the system. There is a place for skilled migration in our country, but this, but this, that this government cannot use the system alone to fix our skills crisis. Senator Green, the time for this debate has expired. It being 9.50 p.m., I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Stoker. President, I rise to provide context and to apologise for any genuine hurt caused by a comment I made last Thursday, which was raised in this chamber during question time today. The comments made were in response to a question about the closure of Queensland's borders, an issue which has caused many constituents of mine to contact me with heart-wrenching and emotional accounts of the damage that it was causing to them and to their businesses and to their families. Oh, I'd heard devastating stories of livelihoods lost, people whose mental health was tenuous because of the financial stress that they were suffering and stories of families struggling to get by given the loss of their jobs in the tourism and hospitality industries. I'm willing to admit it. I was angry. I still am. I likened the Queensland Premier's refusal to open the borders to choking the Queensland economy. I used an unfortunate turn of phrase. It wasn't premeditated, rehearsed or intended to offend. Show some grace, Senator Watt. It was an impromptu comment meant to demonstrate to those people affected by those border closures that someone understood their pain. Now, some of those opposite have sought to sensationalise that comment beyond its intent. For anyone genuinely hurt or offended, please know that was never my intention, and I do apologise for any genuine offence or hurt caused. But one thing I know is that Labor, and specifically Senator Watt, are not genuinely offended. If they were, they would have raised it last week. Instead, they waited Order. for a news day where they badly needed a distraction from Labor's corruption allegations. I note that while they are fast to claim outrage Order. when someone who is not part of their political tribe is loose with their language, there is silence, crickets, when a member Order. of the left does the same thing. I won't repeat my concern about that hypocrisy, which I raised in this chamber last Tuesday, but I did want to put these remarks on the record tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I wish to draw the attention of the <clears throat> Senate to a very important matter regarding the national interest, uh, particularly with regard to Australia's renewable energy future, foreign investment and the security Order. of Australian utilities. That matter is the reputed management of pumped hydro resources by Chinese company Goldwind. In my great state, New South Wales, pumped hydro plants will be critical to Australia's future renewable energy. Research from a, the Australian National University has found that there are 22,000 potential sites across Australia for pumped hydro energy storage. Pumped hydro can be developed quickly and is the lowest cost large-scale energy storage technology. Given the pending closure of the Liddell power station, pumped hydro should be an, a clear contender to replace its impact on the grid, to push down power prices and support the transition to a renewable energy market. 
Realising this, Water New South Wales ran a process to seek input on the development of commercial pumped hydro assets on some of their dams. Yet this process was flawed from the start. A number of bidders have commented that it was like they were bidding for a toll road, public-private partnership, triple P contract. The process was run so poorly and the proposed terms of a deal so restrictive that large Australian players in the electricity business, like Origin, AGL and Meridian Energy Australia, pulled out of the competitive process. Which brings us to the company which has been rumoured to have won the bid, Goldwind. Why would this company want to invest in this process that other energy retailers don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole? What potential gains did it see that Origin, Meridian and AGL were unable to find in this process? And why also has Goldwind repeatedly lied and obfuscated about their relationship and indeed ownership by the Chinese Communist Party? I am deeply, deeply troubled by these rumours and the prospect of a major utility with access to critical New South Wales energy assets owned and managed by a company with major ties to a foreign power. What's even more troubling to me is Goldwyn's desire to hide their ties with the ruling Chinese Communist Party. They have repeatedly denied any links to the CCP. Let us just look at the facts. Goldwyn was established in the 1980s, was owned by the Chinese Communist Party until it was listed. Over 40 per cent of the current investors in Goldwyn, just gathered from among the top 10 shareholders, of, are unquestionably state-owned corporations. All companies within the People's Republic of China are ultimately controlled by the government. More troubling facts emerged as I heard more about Goldwyn. In the midst of a pandemic, it was reported in the Beijing Business Today publication that Goldwyn shipped critical medical supplies to China out of Australia and other countries. And I quote from the translated article, in the early stage of the outbreak, Goldwyn Technology used the company's global business network and channels to purchase medical surgical masks, protective clothing, medical isolation goggles and medical gloves in many countries and regions such as the United States, Germany, Australia, Turkey and Ukraine, a variety of domestically needed anti-epidemic materials and received active local help, provided strong support for the domestic fight against the epidemic. This is what Goldwyn has appeared to do with medical technology that Australia and its medical professions needed to fight the pandemic. Should this company, Goldwyn, be trusted with Australian infrastructure critical to Australia's future energy needs? If they cannot be trusted with medical gloves and masks, how can we expect them to act in Australia's interest with our dams and our power grid? It's also very surprising to find that a process led by KPMG would allow a company like Goldwyn to participate in bids for critical Australian infrastructure. I was troubled to learn that while KPMG were running the process for Water New South Wales, they were also re receiving large contracts from Goldwing advising them regarding their wind farm business. This is yet another example of dual loyalties or conflicts of interest from one of the big four firms that throws a cloud over the entire process. I will reiterate that I have been informed of these troubling matters about the acquisition of these dams by Goldwind by concerned citizens who have contacted me because of their genuine desire to protect national security and concerns about the LNP's failure to protect our sovereignty. We've seen from the Chow Tai Fuk Alinta energy purchase scandal earlier this year that strict conditions actually need to be enforced on foreign investors when they purchase Australian utilities. Otherwise, Australians are put at risk. Goldwyn's alleged behaviour during the pandemic does not give me great confidence in their ability to run our utilities should another crisis of the scale and impact of COVID-19 hit Australia. 
Pumped hydro will provide the energy for Australia's future, provide much needed jobs for regional New South Wales, and ensure that Australia fights climate change in a responsible and orderly way. This is a critical piece of infrastructure, a critical infrastructure asset that we can't afford to bungle. The purchase of a key national water security asset, intimately entwined within, with stable electricity supply, is not a process that we can allow to be bungled. It's not a process that should enable acquisition and control by those who have so clearly shown during the COVID-19 crisis that they do not have Australia's best interests at heart. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to speak on a fundamental for human progress, freedom and freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is enshrined in our country after many High Court rulings. It's not specifically covered in our Constitution, yet it's implied. And because the High Court, Court's rulings, it is enshrined in our country. And yet today, freedom of speech is under threat, and it's under threat in this parliament. In fact, our whole way of life is under threat. Listen to these wise words of American, African American economist and philosopher Thomas Sowell. He says, we are living in an era where sanity is controversial, and insanity is just another viewpoint, and degeneracy only another lifestyle. And this point from Thomas Sowell, have we reached the ultimate stage of absurdity when some people are held responsible for things that happened before they were born, while other people are not held responsible for what they themselves are doing today? Take the case of all lives matter. Surely there wouldn't be anyone in Australia who would disagree that all lives matter. Yet in just four days, we witnessed the following events. Labor Senator Helen Polly tweeted the words, all lives matter, last Tuesday, and she was eaten alive by her own party. She retracted the tweet. Senator Pauline Hanson stated in her Matter of Public Importance speech that we need, and she wants, all people to be equal under the law. Yet Green Senators Rice and McKim and Labor, Senators Ayer, Labor Senator Ayres implied or stated that Senator Hanson is racist and that I am racist. Senator McKim said it before I even, uh, even started my speech. Their statements and implied statements are false. They are lies. And lies are a form of control. People lie when they lack a coherent argument and it cannot counter our position, cannot counter our argument, so they resort to personal attacks and lies. Liberal speakers, during Senator Hanson's matter of public importance, said many times that all lives matter. And Senator Hanson moved a motion then, tried to move a motion the next day that all lives matter. The government and Labor stopped Senator Hanson. All senators in this chamber, except for me and Senator Hanson, disagreed, it seems, that all lives matter. So the people leading this country don't think that all lives matter. The next day, the fourth day, I tried to present graph, tried to present data showing the data on deaths in custody, and the government stopped me. Stopped me presenting their own data. Notice that I said deaths in custody. Not black deaths in custody, not Aboriginal deaths in custody, deaths in custody. And it came in this report. Now I'll go through that data from the Australian government's own Australian Institute of Criminology. It's the latest report. It's the 2020 report entitled Deaths in Custody in Australia, written by Laura Doherty and Samantha Bricknell. In 2017-18, the rate of death in custody for prisoner types was Indigenous persons, 0.14 per 100 prisoners. Non-Indigenous persons, 0.18 per 100 prisoners. Now, non-Indigenous appears to be 25 per cent higher. Yet I tell the truth, and I do not mislead. This would not be statistically significant difference as the sample numbers are so small. So we can say without any, without any uh, uh, doubt that non-Indigenous and Indigenous persons died in custody at roughly the same rate. 
The 2017-2018 total deaths in police custody and custody-related operations was Indigenous people, three. Non-Indigenous people, 14. In 2017-18, 79 per cent of Indigenous deaths in prison custody were due to natural causes. Four-fifths of deaths in prison custody were due to natural causes. Over the decade to 2018, non-Indigenous persons were nearly as non-Indigenous persons were nearly twice as likely as Indigenous persons to hang themselves in prison custody. Motor vehicle pursuits represented 38 per cent of Indigenous deaths in police custody and custody-related operations. Almost four in ten driving the vehicle themselves. From 2006 to 2016. A 41 per cent increase in Indigenous imprisonment rates corresponded almost exactly with a 42 per cent increase in people identifying as Indigenous. In other words, the rate of Indigenous deaths in custody stayed the same in proportion and did not increase. Using the figure of 437 unconvicted Indigenous deaths without reference to critical detail and context results in a distorted discussion of Indigenous issues. And when real issues remain hidden, they cannot be solved. That leads to proposed solutions being not useful and possibly harmful. The issue is not unequal treatment before the law. The real issue for Aboriginal people may be lifestyle or cultural or poverty or welfare dependency. But let's have the truth, because only then can we identify core problems and only then can we identify core solutions. Only then can we really care for the disadvantaged and help them solve the challenges they face. But all people must be equal before the law. Another real issue, then, is dishonesty in parliament and fear of data. Fear of data! That's what brings objectivity. And yet the people in this parliament run from it, their own data. So I want to make these core points. Number one, these are hard data from the government's own agency, yet the government is jumping from its own shadow, afraid to debate, even though the points are supportive of their case. That begs the question. Is the government af afraid of a split within its own ranks, the wokes versus the real liberals? Now, several liberals have approached me in disgust of their party's fear of data and reality. Number two, the left or control side of politics hates data. It undermines their use of opinion hearsay, smears, emotions, propaganda and lies to hijack issues. That fabricates victims and that weakens the very people they claim to be helping. Their ideology is based on victimhood as a means of creating division and separation. And that cripples people. Thirdly, the government's position in suppressing the data shows a fear of data, a disdain of data, a disrespect for people. Highlights how, it highlights how issues are pushed to avoid data. Climate. Senator Ian Macdonald stood up there, the former Senator Ian Macdonald stood up there in the last Monday of 2016 and said, looked across at me and said, I don't always agree with Senator Roberts, but I've got to admit and respect him for starting the debate on the climate science that we have never had in this parliament and still have not had. The absence of data allows destructive policies that are hurting and killing people and certainly making life miserable financially, materially and emotionally. With the exception of Senator Hanson and myself, all other senators have effectively voted that all lives do not matter. All other senators have effectively voted that they are not interested in data, not interested in objectivity, not interested in truth. I stand by my belief and statement, and that is this, all lives matter. I will continue to support free speech as crucial for democracy and freedom and essential for freedom that is essential for human progress. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. There being no... Oh, Senator Scar. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were speaking from the seat. Thank you, Mr. President. So I rise tonight to uh, acknowledge and express my deep appreciation to two faith-based community organisations in the Ipswich Springfield region who are doing wonderful work to assist Queenslanders who are suffering during the coronavirus pandemic. 
They're doing that great Australian thing of reaching out and extending a helping hand to people in need. The first of those organisations is a wonderful organisation called the West Side Community Care Network. And they're the charity arm of the Springfield Christian family, led by a wonderful Australian by the name of Pastor Phil Cutcliffe. And I had the pleasure of visiting uh, their establishment and seeing firsthand the great work they're doing in terms of distributing groceries, blankets, warm clothing, secondhand goods to people in need during the coronavirus pandemic. And it really was heartwarming, absolutely heartwarming. And one of the things I took away from that visit was an expression that they use, and it's called pay it forward, pay it forward. And what that means, what that means, Mr. President, is that if someone do, does, if you do someone a good deed and they seek to repay you, then you say to that person, no, don't repay me, pay it forward, help someone else. I've helped you, now you help someone else, pay it forward. It's a wonderful concept, it's a wonderful concept. And perhaps the, the best compliment I could uh, perhaps pay to Pastor Phil Cutcliffe and the wonderful volunteers at Westside Community Care Network is I've actually been reflecting on that concept and how it could be applied in my own life. So just a wonderful, wonderful concept. Another thing which I took away from the visit was the wonderful positive energy that was there, the wonderful group of volunteers. And one of their volunteers had actually previously received help from Westside Community Care Network. And that's a great example of that pay it forward concept of helping people once you've been helped yourself. I'd like to name some of the volunteers I met on the day, wonderful people, all of them. Sherry Horwood, Yvette Atkins, June Johnson, Tasha Tutagalavo, Rhonda Lawson, Celine Dew, Helen Dew, Colin Lacassi, Tamahana Johnston, just wonderful, wonderful people. And I think they were all, from my perspective, summed up in, some, in a conversation I had with Colin, Cole. And Cole told me how um, he'd actually helped his community uh, that was hit hard by the floods in Brisbane um, a number of years ago now. And that on one occasion, there were some political leaders and journalists who wanted to come along and do some media with Cole. And Cole said, no, I'm not going to do media with you because it's not about me. It's about the community. It's about the community. Just a wonderful, wonderful human being, as they all are wonderful, wonderful people. And Pastor Phil Cutcliffe, I think, summed up the philosophy of Westside Community Care Network when he said, and I quote, we try to show unconditional love, not just to people that we know, but to anyone. We try to show unconditional love, not just to people that we know, but to anyone. So I saw that in practice and I saw what it meant to the people who went to Westside Community Care Network for assistance. And I really do express my deep appreciation to them. The second organisation I visited was City Hope Care, which is led by Pastor Mark Edwards. He's the senior minister of City Hope Church. And they've been providing during the coronavirus pandemic hampers of hope emergency hampers. And when I entered into uh, the City Hope Church, there was a wall, a very, a very high wall, and it was covered with these hampers. It was extraordinarily impressive, dozens and dozens of hampers. And they told me that they've been sending out over 100 hampers distributed through their agency partners each week during the coronavirus pandemic, 100 hampers a week. And each hamper is specifically tailored to meet the needs of the family or group receiving them and contain various food items alongside additional supplies such as nappies, baby food, pet food and even some basic household appliances. Each month they're sending out between $7,000 and $15,000 worth of goods out to those who need them. And it's not the first time that City Hope Care has, uh, has been helping people in need. They have a wonderful project where they have domestic and family violence packs. Domestic and family violence packs. And they showed me these packs. And in conjunction with the Queensland Police, if there's a family that's impacted by domestic violence, they provide these packs to the police and the police will actually provide it 
to, the, to mothers and kids who have fled a domestic violence situation. And it actually gives them a bit of confidence, a bit of hope, because it's specifically tailored to the situation of each family. So they have packs for uh, a lady who's in distress with uh, small toddlers, and they'll, they'll have a pack tailored in particular for an older lady in the same situ situation. And they told me that the impact of these domestic and family violence packs is just extraordinary in terms of giving people hope and giving people confidence. And I'd like to pay my uh, respects and pay tribute to all of the people who I met, many volunteers at City Hope Care. As I said, led by the marvellous Pastor Mark Edwards. There was also Pastor Ryan Germain, who's the Ripley Campus Pastor. Sarah Doherty, General Manager and Executive Assistant to the Office of the Senior Minister. Glenda Coxeter, who's the Manager of City Hope Care. Amanda McLeod, who is the Hampers of Hope team leader. And two wonderful volunteers, two wonderful volunteers who were there when I visited. And they reminded me of Colin, who I visited and, and met at the Westside Community Care Network. And their names are Russell Wilkes and Sally Ann Wilkes. And you really do know that you've, that you've met a fabulous volunteer when the leader of the organisation takes you aside and whispers in, you, in your ear, you know, Paul, uh, they just keep turning up. And sometimes we need to tell them, you need to go home and rest. You've just been here too long. You need to go home and rest. But they won't rest. They won't rest until the job is done. Russell Wilkes and Sally Ann Wilkes, I congratulate you for all of your efforts. So, Mr President, at this time of this coronavirus pandemic, I never cease to be inspired. I never cease to be inspired by all of the wonderful community organisations, and this, and in this case, two faith-based community organisations in the Ipswich, Ripley, Springfield area, who are doing wonderful work, extending the helping hand to their fellow Australians and representing all that is good about Australia. Thank you, Senator Scar. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.